Thank you. Good morning. It's a privilege to be with you guys today, and I just I need to say a few words uh, about Matt and Toby first. Uh, I met Toby at a One Hope Pastors Conference five years ago. We have kids similar ages, and um, we connected in a prayer time, and we've been meeting ever since. And I'm not sure I would be here in Eugene. I know I would not be where I'm at in Eugene without Toby's encouragement and, and strength. When we hired Matt a few years ago, he was so excited. And Matt, he has been so encouraged by your presence, by your, by your pastoring with and by and beside. And, and one of our pastors at our church, First Baptist Eugene Levi, loves serving along with you guys in your summer camp. It's, it's in his words, the highlight of my year. And I go, uh, that is awesome. That is awesome that it is the highlight of his year. Though he's a worship leader all year long, he loves driving boat and being with kids and working with Matt and your church and that consortium as they, as they reach out for Christ. So what an incredible privilege it is to serve in a community where pastors know other pastors and churches work with other churches. Um, you might know some of our kids. My kids and my family is serving over at our church this morning, and so uh, we're not all here together. We used to travel together as missionaries. Um, my kids know how to move into churches and other churches, and they're like, Dad, can we please not? And uh, so, but you might have seen my kids. If you're with Hosanna Dance, my daughter danced for Hosanna for the last three or four years, and last year she was the Lady of the Forest in, in the Narnia presentation. And you might know my son. Um, he runs all over Eugene, six and eight and 10 miles, and he likes to wear bright pink and bright salmon-colored shoes. And um, my church knows him by the pink shoe guy who runs all around. So um, you might have actually seen him running the streets uh, of Eugene, because that's what he does. You wouldn't probably know my youngest daughter unless you are associated with swimming, because she spends half her life in a pool. And she swam all year in Amazon pool, because it's the one pool that's open. So we've been joking. She has an August size tan in April. So. Um, because she's been outside all, all year. So anyway, our family, my wife and I have been married for 23 years, and, um, but it's a privilege to be with you this morning. So, you know, I know that Mother's Day can be, um, can be a time of incredible celebration, and it can also be a time of, of conflicting thoughts. Um, some people have wanted to be mothers, and they were not able to. Uh, some people have conflictive relationships with their parents, other people, um, they have some amazing stories of being a mother. And so it's just this very interesting minefield of a day, even when you are speaking into. Uh, we have a friend who is single, and she's 31 years old. And she says, I frequently get told, Happy Mother's Day. And I'm not sure what to do with that, because I've wanted to be a mother for many, many years, but I'm not. And I think that they're saying something congratulatory, but it's a deep, you know, I don't know what to do with that. And, and so I know this day can be a mixed emotion day. And we're going to look at that today, today in God's Word. We're going to look at times of belief and of grief and how Jesus is in that in both places, in both places. And I was thinking, because I, uh, I was on a hike with my wife, and we were going up uh, Spencer's Butte, up the backside. And as we were walking up Spencer's Butte, up the backside, there was this family that was coming down the, the, the other way, and it turns out that the kids, of course, were way out in front, and they were running along, and the parents were like, hey, wait up, and wait up. And uh, this little girl, like five or six, tripped and fell as they, were, as they were going along up ahead. And she fell and obviously hurt her knee, and I had this interesting reaction, because I went to go, and then I was like, wait, I don't know if I can because of COVID. And I thought, I feel bad. I'm, I, I don't know if the parents would want me to help their child or not. or be. I, I'm not quite sure. So I just kind of waited. And I saw the parents were coming. And, and I decided the safest thing was to just make sure she was OK, but try and figure out what the parents would want to have happen. And the, the girl had fallen and skinned her knee. And I could tell she like wanted to cry, but that was not the right time. Like She waited until her parents came along. And then as her parents came and then were with her, she began to grieve <laughs> and pour out her feelings for having fallen down and skinned her knee and they picked her up. And, and it made me think every grief has a time frame. Every grief has a time frame. Uh, and those time frames are different. You know, you might grieve in that moment. You might wait to grieve or, or you might not even realize what is going on. But every grief has a time frame. And when those things happen, sometimes we begin to question. There are some doubts that come to us often in our grief. And one of those can be, God, God, where are you? I'm grieving. 
Where, where are you? This is happening. I have lost this. Or, and, and it seems like sometimes in those spaces, God's time frame and our time frame are almost never the same. Have you experienced that? So what do we do with our grief? So, so on Mother's Day, I'd like to speak into belief and grief and how God is present in both. And we're going to look at the Bible. If you are not a person who reads the Bible, I've just finished going through 12 stories of the Bible. And it has been fascinating to read the Bible uh, anew. And so it is okay. If, if this is your first time reading through part of the scriptures, that is okay to read. If this is your 50th time reading through a story of the scriptures, that is okay. We're going to look at it together. We're going to be in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 11. In John 11, I'm going to start reading in verse 20, and let me set the context. Uh, Jesus has some friends in the um, town of Bethany, and it is Mary, Martha, and the brother Lazarus. There are these three siblings together, and uh, Mary, Martha's brother Lazarus got very sick. And so they sent word to Jesus saying, Lazarus is sick, come quickly. But Jesus chose to wait where he was two days, and then it took him two days travel. And by the time that he arrived, Lazarus had already died from the sickness, and he'd been buried and in the tomb for four days. And so Jesus arrives at the town of Bethany, and we'll pick up in verse 20. This is where the story picks up. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and she met him. But Mary remained seated in the house, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Now you need to know that Martha is one of my favorite characters of the Bible. She is a woman of great faith, of incredible faith. She saw Jesus and who he was before others did. And in this moment of grief, she has a question for him. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And I think it's actually more of a statement than a question if you read it. She's more saying, Jesus, where were you? Where were you? I know that things would have been different if you had been present. Why did you leave in the first place? Why couldn't you have just stayed here? And, and when we called, why didn't you? Uh, where were you? Lazarus is now dead. You know, um, bucket lists, there are things that we want to do before we die. You ever heard that term or that phrase? I remember there were, there were these things I wanted to do before I kicked the bucket, you know? <laughs> I was in high school, and um, I wanted to be in the Olympics. And if not the Olympics, at least run a marathon, you know? Um, I haven't done either. I, I wanted to travel and maybe live in a foreign country and, you know, something exotic and, you know, with a, and I have, but it had no coastline like I imagined. It didn't have palm trees like I had, and, but we did live for a decade in, in a foreign country. And I also wanted to ride a unicycle and be a clown in a circus. True story for another time, but it was on my bucket list in high school. There was another item on my bucket list. Um, I had this idea of, of getting married and raising kids and being near my family and having our kids interact with the other kids and with, with, with their grandparents, with my parents. And I didn't realize how much that was a dream on my bucket list until it disappeared. See, in 2013, when we were living in South America, my dad was diagnosed with cancer and he passed away 11 months later. And I didn't realize till it happened that when someone dies, they don't just pass away. It's a death of a dream for everybody around them. There are often hopes and dreams and desires of, of people that are around that person. It isn't just the death of a person, but it's the death of all those hopes. You see, grief happens because death kills a time frame. It changes our hopes. And Martha was going to Jesus and saying, Jesus, my time frame just got changed. I had dreams and I had hopes and Lazarus was here and we had, and it's now gone. And it's been gone for four days. Where were you? Where were you, Jesus? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But you see, Jesus knew that every hope has a time frame too. Not just every grief has a time frame, but every, every hope has a time frame. 
Every hope has a time frame. So let's keep reading the story. Even now I know, Martha said, whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. If you are a parent, you've probably heard these words, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you know, you tell your kids something, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You know. And you do the, I know, I know, I know, I know, right? You know, things, we often say, I know, I know, I know, about things we really don't know, and we just want the person to back away. It's actually a way to say, stop talking to me, let me do it myself. I have it all figured out, and then something happens that we don't expect, and we actually realize, I didn't know. I didn't know, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you know? Because we can, we can know, know, know something that we actually don't do, 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 you know? Belief is when knowledge becomes a behavior. Belief is when knowledge becomes a behavior. When it moves from knowing to doing. See, knowledge is about content, but belief is about action. Knowledge is about information, but belief is about transformation. Belief is about transformation. I'm not sure how to move it. There we go. <clears throat> You know, often our bodies, they respond to situations before our, our conscious minds can even process. Have you ever noticed there's a thing called a flight, fight or flight response? And, uh, and that means that you will notice things and respond to them before your body, um, before your mind can even process what's happening. Because there's this conscious part of us, there's this subconscious part of us. There's, there's, a, there's a way that you can notice. Do you remember when, if you, do you remember back, those of you who are older, your teenage years? If you're a teenager, you're currently experiencing this. Uh, you have feelings for somebody. You can have feelings for somebody before you even know what or why it's happening. You just, it's just happening because there's a subconscious part of us that, that responds to things before our conscious minds can catch up. Think about your memories. Your memories are often stored, if you think about your deepest memories, you, you sometimes can't even remember exactly what happened, but you can remember how you felt how it impacted you, what was going on inside of you, because that's stored in your intuitive part of your body, right? And that's why information and knowledge is important, but unless it changes our behavior, unless information goes from our head down into that intuitive part of our bodies, it actually isn't something that we know. It isn't something that we know. And it's why we can know, know, know something that we don't do, 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 because we actually don't believe, believe, believe something that we're saying that we know. Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus says to her these words, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus takes Martha's knowledge and says, do you believe what you just said that you know? Names, they reveal identity. They're, they're really important. And Jesus here is using a name. He's using the name I am. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And there are, there are a number of instances in the book of John where Jesus uses this name I am, which is Yahweh. It's the name that God shared with his people in Exodus 3.14, Yahweh. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. It means the eternally self-existent one. It's the name that God used to Moses. Tell the people that Yahweh, I am, is the God who sent you. You can read that story in Exodus chapter 3. And Jesus uses this name again and again in the book of John to say, I am. A way to put it in colloquial English today would be to say God is for his people what they need him to be at their greatest point of need. When we have our great need, God says, Yahweh, I am with you in that need here and now. And now. Because he is. He is. He is. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. Again and again, Jesus used God's name, because it was his name, to tell his people, I am. You are in need. I am. You are in grief. I am. 
You need belief. I am. I am. God is for his people what they need him to be at their greatest point of need. And Martha and her sister Mary needed to remember at this point God's name. Not something in their mind. They needed to move it right down into their heart, their soul, their intuitive sense. That God's name is I am. And it was as important for them then as it is for us now. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Belief is when knowledge becomes behavior. Behavior. And now here's a story where the story moves and it addresses three doubts that come to us in our grief. Often when we are in grief, when we are in crisis, when we are in fear, when something is happening, there are three doubts that come to us and Jesus will address all three of these because they're very important for our belief. I'm going to skip into verse 32. Verse 32 in the story, Jesus is moving <clears throat> towards the tomb. He says, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same words as her sister. <laughs> Same question. Where were you, Jesus? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's important to know that in this culture, at this time, it was believed that the spirit of a person does not leave until the third day. They could be buried and they could be in a tomb, but their spirit might still be alive. And they might resuscitate. But by the fourth day, they were dead, completely dead. Jesus waited two days, came. Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. All their hopes and dreams were gone. There is no hope. Where were you, Jesus? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who were with him were also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit, and he was greatly troubled. And he said, where did you lay him? And they said to him, come and see. And Jesus wept. I don't know if you've read this story before, and if you have, I, I'd like you to ask yourself a question, and if it's new to you, ask yourself this question, why did Jesus weep? Why did he weep? Jesus actually knew what would come later. He knew he was the resurrection and the life. He knew he had the power. He was the I am. He was God who is and will be. He has power over death. He actually knew what he was going to do next, which was to raise Lazarus from the dead. If you knew that you were going to raise someone from the dead, if I knew that I was going to raise somebody from the dead, I, I think I would act. I would say, hey, stop, stop weeping. C come here, come here, come here, come here. I've got something. C come here, come here. Let me show you something amazing. I would try to stop the grief and invite them into something. But do you realize that belief does not eliminate grief? Jesus entered into grief. Why? Because he loves. Because he loves. This is who Jesus was. He was not about eliminating what was there? He did not ignore what was there. He entered into it with his friends because he loved Lazarus. He loved Mary. He loved Martha. He loved that community. They were in grief. And he entered into it with them and he wept with them because he loves. See, one of the first doubts that comes to us in our grief is that God does not care. I'm the exception to his love. I'm, what, what's going on here is beyond his ability. He must not care. Because of what is going on here. And Jesus enters into their grief, not as a show, not to put on something, but because he loved. Jesus weeps because he loves. And we can think that that phrase, God loves you, Jesus loves you, it's a hoax, it's a farce. When things are going rough, and when things are hard, or when hopes that we have get changed, the time frames get displaced. But Jesus connected grief to belief, and he did not ignore the pain. That he felt nor that they felt. He mourned and he grieved with them. I read this quote recently and it said, Too often when people are hurting, we say things that may be theologically true while adding to our suffering friend's pain. 
One of the most hurtful things we can do is to make a mourner justify their pain. If someone is hurting, the best thing we can say is, tell me why you hurt. Not make them explain it, not make them explain their story. Tell me why you hurt. Enter into that with them. Don't make them justify it. Death is painful. It steals hope. Sin is painful. It breaks relationships. Death changes our time frames, and we weren't made for death. Yet we all experience death, and we all know that death will be coming. We will all die. And Jesus didn't make anyone justify their pain or say, Why are you crying? I'm here. He wept because he loved. Verse 38 says, And Jesus deeply moved again. So it sounds like he wept, and he wept. He came to the tomb, and it was a cave. And a stone lay against it, and Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Culturally speaking, Martha and Mary were the ones that had authority to put the stone on or remove the stone. They were the family. And it was up to them that the stone would be removed. Remember, Knowledge is about content. Belief is about behavior. Knowledge is about information. Belief is about transformation. And Jesus was saying to them, you said you believe. You know who I am. I want you to put your belief in action. Mary and Martha, move this stone. Move this stone. You can know that God gives eternal life until God says, then move this stone and let me work. And so they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of people standing, that you believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. See, the great lie of the enemy, the second great lie, isn't just that God doesn't care. It's that he's not close. He's far away. He's somewhere in some distant space or, or so far. And, and you don't matter, really. And he's so far away, he couldn't possibly see what's going on. So why did Jesus call out to Lazarus? He called because he's close. You can't call from far away. There were no cell phones or telephones. or He was not calling through the internet. He called because he closed. He came to Bethany. He came to Mary Martha's house. He walked with them to the tomb. He wept with them in their community. And when he got to the tomb and the stone was rolled away, he called out. He called out because he was close. Close enough to be heard. And Jesus calls because he's close. He calls because he's close. And verse 43 says, And the man who had died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips. His face was unwrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, Unbind him. Let him go. Why did he heal? He heals because he's God. Which is the third doubt. The third doubt is that Jesus is not powerful. God is not powerful. I'm the, ex I'm the exception. What's going on in my life is too big, too hard, too deadly for God to actually move or act or it's beyond four days the spirit's gone there's nothing that can happen now Jesus where were you and the man who had died came out his hands and his feet bound with linen strips face wrapped with a cloth and Jesus said unbind him do you, do you know that one of the main things we pray for when we pray is, is sickness this person is sick, or this person is not feeling well. Sickness somehow reminds us that we have a great need, right? We want physical healing so bad. Please help us, right? Do you realize that Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he would eventually get sick and die again? And I know that because Lazarus is not around today. He died. All physical healing that God does eventually returns to death for every human being. We pray for physical healing, 
Well, physical healing has a temporary time frame. Your lifetime. That's it. So why did Jesus heal? Why would Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead if he knew that Lazarus would die again? Because Jesus used physical healing to show I can heal spiritually. You can't always touch the spiritual things or see it, but if you can touch the physical things, if you can do that, you can do, yes, I can heal your heart. I can heal what's inside of you. I can heal what's broken in you, and I can give eternal life. Jesus heals because he's God, and he wants to change our time frame. He wants to change our time frame. You see, think about bucket lists again. What's the time frame of a bucket list? A lifetime. What if God wants to change the time frame for our bucket list? <laughs> what if God wants to change the time frame for my bucket list and your bucket list and say, Dan, you will spend time with your dad again if you would change the time frame of your bucket list from a time bound to an eternally bound, from physical healing to spiritual healing. I love you. That's why I weep. I call to you because I'm close. And I heal you because I am your God. I want to change your time frame. Martha spoke and she acted on her belief. Jesus said, if you look back at 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Martha said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. One of the first people to proclaim the divinity of Christ was Martha. And act on it in the verses that followed was Martha. Incredible woman of faith. Not only knew, but moved right down into her heart, and she acted on her knowledge. She brought her fears and her doubts right to Jesus. Where were you? He's here. Why weren't you here? I am here and I'm close. I weep with you and I heal because I'm God. Incredible woman of faith. When I was a kid, I used to get nightmares, especially when I had fevers. And I remember that my parents would come around because I would dream and I'd have these nightmares that I was supposed to be walking on the ceiling and I couldn't, just crazy things. And one time they found me huddled in, in this room and I guess I was wiping my face and, and I, had, I thought I had something written on my face and I couldn't get it off and I couldn't get it off and I just kept wiping whatever was, I thought was on my face. I was terrified in this fever that I, ha that I would have. And to calm me down, they would put a cold washcloth on my neck and they would sit with me until I actually woke up. And they did that because they cared. And they did that because they were close. And they did that because they were my parents and they wanted to bring healing to the situation, to my body. They did that because they were my parents. And during grief, three doubts attack our minds. That God's far away. That God does not care. And even if he was close or care, he wouldn't be powerful enough to take care of whatever it is that's broken. But God is good. He is Yahweh. I am the God who is for his people what they need and be in their greatest time of need. And when we're scared or grieving in any space, we can remember this. God is close. God loves. And he heals because he is God. That's what he does. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me. Though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then Jesus' question lingers for us. Do you believe this? Is it knowledge? Is it knowledge? Or is it belief? Is it content? Or is it action? Is it information? Or is it transformation? Do you believe this? Pastor Matt's going to come and lead us in communion. And I want to invite you as we walk into communion with Jesus. Sometimes we try and purify everything about ourselves and get ourselves to be in this perfect place of understanding. Can I invite you in a different way? If any of these doubts are on your mind, will you bring them to Jesus? Will you say, Jesus, here on this day, I, I, I've been doubting that you are close. I've been doubting that you care. I've been weeping on my own. Or I'm doubting that you are powerful enough to take care of whatever it is that's on my heart.
Will you bring that in communion to Jesus and listen to him as he speaks to you? The same way that Martha, woman of faith, came to Jesus and said, Lord, where were you? Come to Jesus in communion and let him speak to you. Matt, will you come lead us in communion? Mm -hmm.